Hello there, I'm Jonathan Kidd. I'd like to ask the question, what attributes do you need to be a captain? And make the suggestion that perhaps, in fact, you need very few at all. Fabio Capello, the England manager, obviously thinks John Terry has the necessary ingredients because, as we know, he has reappointed him, despite the nation hating Terry with a vengeance because of his alleged inability to keep his dick in his trousers. And, of course, because he plays for Chelsea. Mind you, when I was JT's age, my dick was so hanging out of my trousers it was dragging along the ground. This is a metaphor, by the way. All I'm saying is that I was attempting to get nearly every girl I ever met to join me in the bedroom. No, no, not to tidy my room. My mum did that. No, because my hormones were that way inclined when I was in my teens and twenties, and I basically wanted to shag every girl I met. Now, of course, I'm happy with a strong cup of tea with three sugars and a couple of hours brisk walk on the moors. So consequently, I can't throw stones at JT, I'm afraid, because I was very much in a similar glass house. So, as I said, Fabio Capella has decided that JT is the man. Again, despite his alleged indiscretions. Why? Is it because he shouts louder than the others? Is it because he inspires with his displays? Is it because for him it is the highest achievement for a footballer and this gives him a passion others do not have? Is it because most of the England team have gagging orders against them, so why single JT out anymore? So, as I said, exactly what makes someone a good captain? It makes me ask the same question, but put another way to sound impressive. But it's not. It's almost the same question as before. What does a football captain actually do? Problem. I have never played professional football, so I can only compare the captaincy at the level I played at, which was the Chiswick and District Sunday League Division 2. When I played for my pub team, Castle No Rovers, in the Chiswick and District Sunday League Division 2, our home ground was just by the river opposite Craven Cottage. You could see it from the riverside stand. We were managed by the tactically clueless but charming and eager, chain-smoking, long-haired Tony Pinto, who looked a bit like Francis Rossi out of rock band status quo, if you narrowed your eyes and squinted at him a bit, if you were wanky, who had never registered for us as a player but would turn out for us and pretend to be his brother if we were short of players. Peter Pinto. The only problem with, with that was that when his brother actually played, which was a lot, and they were both booked, well, on those occasions there were many as they both had foul mouths and an ability for useless late challenges, Tony would pretend to be me. He'd wander up to me after the booking and whisper, I've given him your name. For fuck's sake, don't be you from now on and make sure you call me Jonathan. In fact, I was the default name to use whenever whoever was the ringer, the replacement illegal player, was booked. This was because I'd been injured early on one season and not played again that season at all. So the ringers that year were always me, a registered player who wasn't playing. And the tradition lingered. Because my name was always the ringer's name, if I happened to be booked, I'd be Trevor Tucker. You just hope the ref didn't notice you were being called Jonathan on the pitch after he'd booked you as Trevor. I, Jonathan Kidd actually got fined and suspended for 10 games one season for constant foul play, frequent foul and abusive language, and warned about my future conduct. When I actually hadn't been booked or sent off or sworn or broken someone's leg or chased the ref around the pitch at all. I had to pretend to be Graham Godfrey for the period I was suspended in order to play, as someone else had been given Trevor Tucker, possibly Trevor Tucker. And Graham was Cliff Armitage if he was booked. It was bloody complicated. But I'm losing my point. The captaincy in my Sunday League team, as well as names, was frequently passed about like a contagious rash. It looked initially like an honour. The captain would shout at people to make more effort or encourage them with, well played son, or man on, man on, or congratulate them. Well done, Trevor Tucker, if I'd scored or cleared off the line. When I was briefly captain and was called Nick Scott at the time, Nick was Hugh Hastings. That's what I tried to do. Graham Godfrey was our captain more than anyone else, and I think that that was because he was at centre-half, could encourage from this central position, much like JT, of course. And he served a protective role. I don't mean in a football sense. I mean, if anyone threatened to knife you after the game, he and Cliff, the goalie, Cliff was an enormously stomached dustman with tattoos upon tattoos. He'd not bother with his hands as goalie. He'd save with his ample gut. It was clearly a skill as he used to chest the ball away with impressive regularity around the post. Mind you, he'd just lie there after he'd done it completely winded, as, let's face it, it was a totally unfit bag of lard. Graham Godfrey, however, was a fit boy who could look after himself without passing out with exhaustion. If anyone threatened you, Graham would either punch them expertly in the nuts or stamp expertly in their foot when the ref was blindsided, or escort you off the pitch afterwards with an avuncular arm round you. Or both. You stick with me, Trevor. I'll see you right, he'd say. I'd say, no, no, I'm Nick today, Graham. He'd say, no, 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 I'm Cliff. Obviously, escorting wouldn't apply to someone like John Terry, whose role isn't about escorting. 
Graham wasn't particularly vocal because he had no voice after smoking too many cigarettes, and this vocal prowess is always cited by Carlo Ancelotti and Capello as being a reason for John Terry being Chelsea captain and the newly reinstated England captain. He's a vocal presence on the pitch, encouraging and organising. The organising part must be to try and get players not to stray away from the manager's plans or to stick to training ground drills, I suppose. Graham's main role was to shout at people to mark other people and persuade others not to be offside. We had a player called Steve Pratt, whose nature reflected his name. He was the stupidest striker I've ever come across. Nice bloke, though. He couldn't work out that hanging about near the opposition penalty area would make you always offside if the ball was hoofed up the pitch. It was the easiest offside decision ever. He would even admit he was offside. He was such a fuckwit. No playing to the whistle with him. Ref, I'm offside, sorry, he'd shout out. Part of Graham's brief was to try to stop him from giving himself up. Steve, for fuck's sake, stop telling the ref you're offside and come back into an onside position and stop fucking apologising! Graham would scream till his contact lenses would fall out and then we'd be on our knees looking for them. Ridiculous beyond belief. Look for them after the game, the ref would say. Fuck off, Graham would say, and get sent off and have to tell the ref his name was Cliff Armitage. The England captaincy can't be that different from Graham's role, actually. Except I don't think he shouts at anyone to tell them off. He encourages, and perhaps that's the main attribute, encouragement and inspirational performance. Play well and encourage others to play well. I've seen JT in a huddle saying stuff and giving high fives and that weird bloke's football thing of a tap on the arse. Encouragement via patting of bums or high fives or shouting is possibly JT's forte. Encouraging words often on the field. Lots of, come on lads, we can do it, and first up to the ref having a say, or getting to remonstrate with a player when they've had a go at Wayne Rooney. Perhaps just having a stern word with the ref is part of the job. I know that Rio's good at that, so Stevie G, but let's be frank, I can't actually work out why JT's being reinstated when he was banned for his bedroom antics. I mean, if you don't choose from Rio and Stevie and JT, there aren't any obvious candidates you can be sure will be in the team anymore. Frank Lampard, who was captain recently, has been playing so badly, I don't think he'd be picked, so that excludes him as captain. Rooney clearly can't be, because you can't have the England captain raining abuse down at the ref's head and running around like a wounded rhino with a grudge and a face like a raging potato. Who else is there who's a certain selection? Uh, Ash Cole, but he's as hated as JT for his taking a picture of his knob and sending it around the internet, allegedly. But in fact, even without the knowledge of his infidelity, he just doesn't come across as captain material. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Why doesn't he? Because he's left back. Is that a non-captain position? How many England captains have been sent to halves? Perhaps it's because they have a better view of the game. Uh, Billy Wright, Bobby Moore, uh, Terry Butcher, was he? D I've run out. Or was it just strength of personality? Then if so, why isn't Rio still captain? The England side are lacking in so many other areas like ability or skill or cohesion that would it matter if the captain was just the oldest player or the one who had the most caps? And as someone who's so fed up with England's lack of success, I watch it at six times the usual speed on Sky Plus, so as to avoid any disappointment at all, I have to say, I don't actually give a toss. So, there you are, that's solved then.